Okay, I'm going to describe for you a lineup of four different people. They're standing side by side. And after I finish describing each of them to you, I'm going to ask you a question about them. But I want you to keep your answer to yourself. Okay, don't say your answer out loud. There's something about the, this first guy in the lineup that grabs everyone's attention immediately. This guy has a huge head. It's because, but it's because he has a huge brain. His brain is so big that it's exerting so much pressure on his cranium that you can see the veins popping out as the brain, it can't contain it. That's how big his brain is, how big his head is. That's the first guy in the lineup. Second guy in our lineup is a wizard, like a Gandalf type, okay? The third person in our lineup is a Harvard professor who has been teaching at the university for over 30 years. They're wearing their fancy little Harvard sweater with a big H on it. And every time you see their name, there are all these little extra letters written after it, like PhD, MBA, etc., etc., etc. The fourth person that rounds out our lineup is currently homeless, living on the street. And you can tell just by looking at them that they are homeless. There's a very rough, haggard exterior to them, matted hair, dirty, homeless. Okay, to recap the four in our lineup, big brain, wizard, Harvard professor, homeless. Now here's the question. Remember, keep your answer to yourself. Which one of these four people is wise? Out of this lineup, who has wisdom? One of them? All of them? None of them? Think about it. You want to know the answer? There is no answer because it's a trick question. <laughs> There's no way to tell who's wise in this lineup of fictitious people and who isn't just from the information that I gave you. I only gave you descriptions of their exterior. I only gave you the cover of the book. I didn't read for you any of the pages of their lives. I only gave you their faces. And if you remember back to what we learned from a couple weeks ago, James taught us that we shouldn't receive someone according to their face alone. We shouldn't make assumptions about a person by the way they appear. And that's true about wisdom. You and I cannot tell who is wise and who is not simply by taking a glance at them. We can't tell who's wise simply by looking at the external features of a person. Sorry, if we can't, there's a question. If we can't tell who's wise simply by looking at the external features of a person, then how can we tell the difference between who is wise and who isn't? And that is exactly what James is going to teach us in the next section of his letter that we're looking at tonight. Our text for this evening, if you haven't turned there already in your Bibles, is James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Although I'm going to have the verses on the screen for you as we go along, it's always a good idea for you to have your Bible with you, open to the place that we're studying together so that you can see that what I'm telling you is right there in your very own Bible. And don't be afraid to interact with your Bible too. Make notes in the margin when something strikes you. Underlying key words, use your Bible. So this section in James 3 opens with a question. James asks his readers, Who among you is wise and understanding? James treats the lump sum of the Christians that he's writing to as one big lineup, like the imaginary lineup that I gave you earlier. James asks his readers to survey all those in the church, and he asks them, Who among you has wisdom? Since they can't differentiate who has wisdom from who doesn't, simply by looking at each other, James goes on to describe what wisdom looks like. This way, his readers will know how to answer his question. So picking things up halfway through verse 13, James goes on, By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. And right off the bat, we learn two things about wisdom from James in this half verse. The first Wisdom is visible. He says by his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. Wisdom can be seen and recognized in a person's life by outside observers. You can show it and others can see it. Wisdom is a lot like faith in this way. You can't see a person's faith. What a person believes about Jesus just by looking at them. You can't see into their heart and into their mind to see what they believe. 
But you can tell what a person believes about Jesus by their actions or their works. Their visible works make their invisible faith visible. James has already walked us through this in his letter. And the same logic can be applied to wisdom here too. You can't see a person's wisdom, what they know or understand about Jesus just by looking at them. But you can tell what a person understands about Jesus by the way in which they do their actions or their works. By the manner in which they obey God. Their visible actions or their wise actions makes their invisible understanding visible. I'm going to give some examples of what wisdom looks like near the end of our time. I'm going to wait till after we hear all that James has to say about wisdom in this passage first. So first off, wisdom is visible. Second, wisdom is gentle. James says, by his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. This word gentle comes up twice in our text. If you're using the CSB translation, like I am, Once here in verse 13 and again in verse 17. But James actually uses two different Greek words that are both translated into the same English word as gentle in the CSB. Now this first usage of gentle is also translated as humble in some other Bible translations. It's the word for meekness. So when you see wisdom in action, when you see someone being wise, you will notice that they are gentle, humble, and meek. Meekness is a strength under control. Like a mighty wild stallion who has been tamed by its rider, its life is governed and directed by by wherever the rider wants it to go. The wise person has subdued themselves under the mighty hand of God and they are guided by him. They submit themselves to his authority. And this person ends up doing God's work in a way that would both honor God and honor those who God has called them to serve. Wisdom is visible, and when we see someone who has it, we will see someone who exhibits gentleness or a meek humility that governs their actions. Verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. The third thing James teaches us about wisdom in this passage is that wisdom isn't self-seeking. James says, don't boast that you are wise if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart because bitter envy and selfish ambition are incompatible with the kind of wisdom James is teaching us about. Now it takes a certain level of self-awareness and humility for someone to recognize if these two negative traits mark their life in any way. And if you realize that you don't have wisdom because you have bitter envy and selfish ambition instead, you shouldn't be going around boasting claiming that you are wise when you aren't. The person who harbors bitter envy in their heart looks at what others have or the things they do or the positions they've been given and they get mad that they don't have what others do. Do you ever covet what others have been given? Does it make you bitter inside when you compare yourself to someone else? Have you ever drunk uh, kombucha? Anyone? It's gross, right? I'll, be, I'll say it. It's, bi- it's bitter. The bitter person James is describing is drinking spiritual kombucha for their soul instead of that cool, fresh, living water that God supplies. Being bitter is a miserable way to live. And James couples this bitter envy with selfish ambition. There's a kind of ambition that is good. There's a kind of zeal for the Lord that's commendable. The kind that doesn't consider themselves important, but loses their life for the sake of Christ and the gospel and the church in such a way that they chase hard after doing the Lord's will in their life, whatever that happens to be, without giving a second thought to how their pursuit of the things of God will enhance their own personal situation. James isn't talking about that kind of ambition. He's talking about the kind of ambition that has been twisted and perverted so that it has oneself at the very center of the equation. It's good to serve people, both in the church and in the world. But do you look for opportunities to serve people simply because of the benefit that it could bring into their life? Or when you serve others, do you contemplate how you can benefit from your service to them? 
Do you want positions at work, in the world, or even in the church because of what it can add to your life and not for what you can add to others? Do you do what you do for God and others? Do you do what you do? Hang with me for a second here. <laughs> do you do what you do you do what you do for God? There you go. There you go. There you go. Do whatever you do, are you doing it for God and for others? Or do you do it for you? One is selfish and self selfish selfless ambition. The other is the selfish version of ambition. Both bitter envy and selfish ambition start out invisible on the inside of a person. These are heart attitudes that can remain invisible for some time, but it's only a matter of time before they be come to the surface. Both of them will also be made visible over time. Jesus said that whatever is concealed will eventually be revealed. Matthew eleven twenty six 26, this is Jesus. There's nothing covered that won't be uncovered and nothing hidden that won't be made known. Things in our heart, either good or bad, will eventually float up to the surface of our lives where other people can see them. That's why when it comes to the important task of appointing leaders in the local church, namely raising up new elders to share in the pastoral work of the church, Paul instructs his apostolic delegate Tim Timothy to not appoint new believers to the office of elder. And he also tells them that prospective leaders must be tested first. There needs to be adequate time given to watching a person's life to see not just what they do, but how they do it and why they do it. And enough time needs to be given to see if there are any unhealthy areas in a person's life that needs to float to the surface. The absolute last thing any church needs is elders who are ruled by bitter envy and selfish ambition. And we'd much rather see those things float to the top during the initial testing phase of them instead of them coming up seemingly out of nowhere after they've already been instilled in the office of elder. James goes on, verse 15. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. The fourth thing we learn about wisdom according to James is that wisdom, the kind that we should want, is godly, as opposed to earthly, unspiritual, demonic. James highlights two sources of two different kinds of wisdom here in verse 15. If you like making notes or marks in your Bible, I would put little quotation marks around the word wisdom in verse 15. They didn't use punctuation marks when they wrote the Bible. If they did, James very likely would have used them for the word wisdom here. And why would he do that? Because this wisdom isn't true wisdom. It's wisdom there's a wisdom that comes down from above. It comes from heaven. It comes from God. And it's gentle. It's not self-serving. This is the true wisdom that everyone should want. But there's another wisdom that doesn't come from God. And this wisdom is fueled by bitter envy and selfish ambition. Where does that kind of wisdom come from? It doesn't come from Jesus' postal code in heaven. It comes from our postal code here on earth. James says that kind of wisdom is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. It's earthly, meaning it's of this world. Earthly wisdom pertains to the values and the systems of this world. It does not account for the values and the systems of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is upside down compared to the way the kingdom of this world operates, or right side up depending on your perspective. The king of heaven says that the first will be last and the last will be first. King Jesus says that you serve in order to be great. But the kingdom of this world, the philosophy of this world teaches us the complete opposite. This world says that the first will be first and everyone else is a loser. This world says that you should aspire to greatness so that others will serve you. Not the other way around, like King Jesus says. The wisdom of this world is earthly and it contradicts the wisdom that comes from above. 
and it's unspiritual as opposed to being spiritual. It's a natural wisdom. This is the only way a person who hasn't been born again can operate. If you haven't yet put your faith in Christ, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, you can only operate according to a natural wisdom that's of this world. If you are not a Christian, you can be, praise God. But if you're not, then you do not have the Spirit of God living in you. It's that Spirit in us that produces the wisdom that comes down from heaven. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us access to God's wisdom. But no Spirit of God? Then you can only operate based upon your natural abilities, your natural inclinations, your natural senses. If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, then you cannot access God's understanding and wisdom. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And Hebrews 11.6 says, Now without faith, it's impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to Him must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who seek Him. You need to believe that God exists before you can receive anything from Him. But when you not only believe He exists, when you actually come to Him in faith, you can receive the good things that He wants to put into your life. And one of those good things is the wisdom that comes down from heaven. But you can't have godly wisdom without God. The wisdom of this world is earthly, it's unspiritual, and the cherry on top? James says that the world's wisdom is demonic. Demonic. If you don't have God, you are not operating your life in a vacuum absent from any other outside influences. If you don't have God in your life, you are not interacting with nothingness. This world lies under the power of Satan and his minions to do his bidding. And if you are not being influenced by God's spirit, you are being influenced by the God of this world. There are, those are the only two options available to you. And if you are not understanding life through God's perspective, if you're not seeing life through God's lens, then the way you view all of life is shaped by the one who stands in opposition to God and to all that is good, right, and true. It's the overarching worldview that exists in our world today. And it is a worldview that is propagated by demons. It's a way of thinking, a way of living that is taught, encouraged, and celebrated. It's a way of living that takes God completely out of the equation. And once he's out, then you become the focus of all your life's endeavors. God says to love God and to love your neighbor. Demons tell you to love yourself. Demons tell you that it's in your best interest to have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart. Get yours. Get as much of it as possible. Because this life is all there is. So you better maximize it to the absolute fullest. Demonic wisdom is summed up in a quote by one of the demon's chief prophets, a man named Alistair Crowley, when he said, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Do whatever you want to do. Whatever makes you happy. Whatever gets you higher up the corporate ladder. Whatever makes you smile. Do that. It doesn't matter how wicked, perverse, backstabbing, selfish it is. Do it if it benefits you. That's the wisdom of this world. And it's earthly unspiritual, demonic. True wisdom, wisdom that comes down from heaven, seeks to prioritize God above self and others above self. It is the complete antithesis of the way this world functions. Now imagine two scenarios. Imagine with me a scenario where earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom prevails. Imagine a world where everyone gives themselves to living like that, what does that world look like? Looks like this world. <laughs> James 3.16 says, For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. Now imagine a scenario where heavenly, Holy Spirit-inspired, godly wisdom prevails. What does that world look like? Looks like Jesus. <laughs> it looks like the way he lived his life sacrificially loving God and loving those he came to serve. It looks like the kind of world that he came to give us. It looks like the kind of world that he's going to bring about in fullness when he comes back to establish his rule and reign over this world. 
It looks like the kind of wisdom James writes about in verse 17. Let's pick it up. He says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. There's a lot here. We're going to go through it pretty quick. The wisdom from above is pure. It's free from ceremonial defilement. It's holy. It's sacred. It's of God. This kind of wisdom reflects his nature and character and goodness. The wisdom from above is peace-loving. It cultivates peace among brothers and sisters in the church. This wisdom doesn't just love peace because you know what? Everybody loves peace. Everybody would prefer peace over contention and faction and divisiveness. But wisdom loves peace so much that the wise person works towards peace. The wise person is a peacemaker. They cultivate peace like a gardener cultivates the garden. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. Wisdom initiates pe peaceful outcomes. It celebrates peace and it strives to maintain peace. The wisdom from above is gentle. This is the second time, remember, we're coming across this word gentle in our text. It has a slightly different meaning compared to the first time we saw it back in verse 13. This gentle means considerate. It's mild, forbearing, it's fair, it's reasonable, it's moderate. Wisdom is gentle and it indicates a willingness to yield to others. The wisdom from above is compliant meaning it's submissive, it's easily persuaded. This doesn't mean a weak gullibility, but a willing deference to others when unalterable theological or moral principles are not involved. The wise person is not a limp, noodle spine spiritual jellyfish that just gives in to whatever someone else wants because of the fear of conflict or fear of sharing preferences. The wise person who is compliant consciously puts others above themselves. Paul captures the essence of this perfectly when he writes to the Christians at Philippi. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. And that's exactly what James is saying about the wisdom that comes from above when he is saying that it's compliant. The wisdom from above is full of mercy and good fruit. Jesus highlighted mercy as a key indicator of the godly person all throughout his ministry. And we see it here in the Sermon on the Mount when he said in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Mercy is a major theme woven throughout all of Jesus' life and teaching. But James also provides his own definition of mercy in his letter. Back in chapter 2, he said that mercy was seen in love for the neighbor that shows itself in action. It's not surprising then that James couples mercy so closely with good fruit. Acts of mercy are those fruits that genuine wisdom, like genuine faith, produce. The wisdom from above is unwavering. It's undoubting. It's simple. It's straightforward. It doesn't make distinctions. It's impartial. It doesn't flip-flop like we saw last week with blessing and cursing that comes out of the same mouth. It doesn't pour out sweet and bitter water from the same spring. It doesn't produce olives and figs from the same tree. It doesn't produce the double-mindedness we saw back in chapter 1 in the person who asks for God for wisdom but doesn't ask in faith. The wisdom from above is without pretense. It's sincere. It's stable. It's trustworthy. It's transparent. The wise person is the kind of person consistently displaying the virtues of wisdom and on whom one can rely for advice and counsel. I said this a lot, so here's a summary, okay? Here's a summary of what wis wisdom is. The wisdom that is not of this world can be seen in a person's life. It's visible. It's not secret hidden knowledge. It's lived out in the open for all to see. This wisdom is gentle, it's humble, and it's meek in nature. Wisdom isn't self-seeking. It's not tainted by bitter envy and selfish ambition. And that's because this wisdom is godly. It comes from him and it represents him. 
This wisdom from above is pure and it loves peace. It's gentle and compliant. It's full of mercy and good fruit and it's unwavering and without pretense. Wisdom takes what we know to be true of God and wisdom shapes the way that we live out the commands of God in our life. It's more than just knowing what we ought to do. Wisdom knows how we ought to go about doing that thing. Here are a few examples of what wisdom looks like. Example number one. God says in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Now this instruction is not just for married couples. This is for everybody. But I know how often the following scenario can happen in marriage. You've both had long days. Something triggers a disagreement and you have a fight right before bed. And you're angry. But God says you have to deal with your anger before you go to bed. Knowledge says, I understand what the Bible says. I can't go to bed without resolving this. But how you go about resolving this will reveal wisdom or a lack thereof. Would it be wise if, when you were both still angry, you went to your spouse and demanded that they get their issues figured out so that you could go to bed in peace because you don't want to disobey God by letting this anger ruminate? Would it be wise to speak sharply, hurriedly, frantically, without concern about how your spouse is actually feeling in the moment? Would it be wise to try and force compliance to the Word of God like that? That doesn't sound very wise after all that we've heard here tonight about wisdom, does it? That doesn't sound gentle, humble, and meek in nature. It doesn't sound peaceable. It doesn't sound like it's full of mercy and good fruit. What would wisdom look like in this situation? Well, first, you would humble yourself before God. You'd ask Him to help you see anything that you need to see in your own life. You'd ask Him to forgive anything in you that isn't pleasing to Him. We all bring something unlovely into disagreements when we have them. You ask Him how He wants you to respond to your spouse. How to go initiate further conversation. How to approach them. What kind of posture to take. What kind of questions to ask. You ask God for the help you need in order to make peace in the situation. You consider your tone of voice. You ask for forgiveness for anything that you can own in the disagreement with your spouse. You voice your desire to work through it and come to a resolution. You seek to hear and understand where your spouse is coming from. This is gentle. This is humble and meek. This seeks to make peace. This is full of mercy and good fruit. It's what the wisdom that comes down from God looks like. Example number two. God says in Galatians 6 verse 10, He says, Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. The Bible says work for the good of all, but especially for those who are part of our Jesus family. That means as long as we have all of our basic needs covered in our lives, we can, in our collective lives as a church, we can and should seek to do good to those who need help, Christian or not. So imagine with me that a team of us Go and feed those who are hungry in the tent city that's forming just a block away from where we meet here. I can know and understand that it would be good to help someone who is hungry to not be hungry anymore. But how I go about feeding the hungry will reveal if there is wisdom in it or not. Would it be wise to go to the tent city and just throw some hot dogs at the people there? Either throwing them directly at the person or throwing them at the tent they're staying in. You technically be giving them food to stave off hunger. But would it be wise? Or what if while you're handing out hot dogs, you pull out your phone and you force one of the people that you're ministering to to take a selfie with you so that you could post it on your social media accounts? Hashtag the book of James. Hashtag no partiality. Hashtag stop receiving the face. Hashtag full of mercy and good fruits. Hashtag wisdom. That doesn't sound very wise at all after hearing all that we've heard here tonight, does it? That kind of wisdom is self-seeking. It's inconsiderate of the one you're serving. 
It has you at the center of it all. It's far from godly because that kind of wisdom doesn't reflect Jesus at all. It doesn't represent heaven. So what would wisdom look like in this situation? Wisdom would ask the Lord to give us a heart full of compassion for the ones that we're serving. We would try to imagine what it would be like to be in their situation if the tables were turned and we were out on the streets instead of them. We'd ask, we'd ask, how would I want to be approached if someone was trying to help me? Wisdom would go in gentleness. It would seek the welfare of the person beyond supplying a single meal. Using discernment, of course, godly wisdom would look to befriend the ones we're ministering to. It would look to genuinely ask how they're doing, what their story is, how did they get to where they are. You can't do this all the time, nor should you all the time. It could be dangerous. They could be high or drunk, and that would limit the way that you would be able to interact with them. But we need to understand this. Most homeless people are not dangerous. Most. You'd be surprised. There are many, so many, where you can have a real down-to-earth conversation with. Conversations that would bless them, but conversations that are going to bless your socks off too. Wisdom that comes down from heaven shapes and influences the way that we minister to those in need. Example number three, God says in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and remember I'm with you always to the end of the age. God says to go make disciples of all nations, share the gospel with them, baptize those who believe it, and then teach them to obey the things that Jesus tells us to do. There, you know, if you notice this, there's not a lot of specific details given on how to do that. Is there room to fulfill the Great Commission differently depending on what circumstances we find ourselves in? Are we going to make disciples in the exact same way here in Coquitlam as we would say if we were in North Korea or in the jungles of Bangladesh? Different circumstances would require different means of walking out the Great Commission. Different doesn't mean wrong. Different just means different. We're probably not street preaching in North Korea. We're probably not using internet marketing to reach people who live in the remote jungles of Bangladesh. We're probably not going to Bible thump people living here in Coquitlam, attempting to force them to put their faith in Jesus. How would we know what to do in each of these situations we might find ourselves in? We humble ourselves. We pursue a meek posture before our Lord. And we ask him for the wisdom that we need in order to obey his commands in a way that would honor him and bless others. Wisdom is not mainly about what you know to do. Wisdom is mainly about how you go about doing what you ought to do. And here in the back half of James chapter 3, James has laid out for us a wisdom that is out, uh, sorry, James has laid out for us what a wisdom that is out of this world looks like. So let me ask you this question. Why should we care about wisdom? Why does James go out of his way to tell his readers about it? I'm going to give you a few things to think about. First one is this. You should want the kind of life that wisdom offers you. In verse 18 of our text, James says that the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. Peace is cultivated by those who exhibit wisdom in their life. Shalom. That should be enough for you right there. Do you want to experience more peace in your dealings with people? Walk in wisdom and peace will be a byproduct of that kind of life. Secondly, we should want the whole church to experience that kind of life. Let's get greedy for a second in a good way. I don't want just one or two of us to experience the fruit of a wise life. I want all of us to experience that kind of collective shalom together. Can you imagine how awesome that would be? Wisdom that produces selflessness, gentleness, purity, and peace everywhere you turn. A whole community marked by that kind of life. That would be awesome. That would be an incubator for church growth. 
Because if we had guests come and visit us and begin to hang out with us more and more and they experienced the fruit that godly wisdom produced, I have a sneaky suspicion that they would be intrigued by what they saw. And they would be more open to learn about this Jesus that makes this kind of family life possible. And thirdly, we need to be able to identify who those people are among us that should eventually become teachers in the church one day. I believe part of what James writes about in verses 13 to 18 addressed the topic he introduced at the very beginning of chapter 3, where he said, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. Do you know who are the ones who think they should become teachers in Jesus' church? Those who think they are wise and understanding. And so James gives a metric to the church by which it can test wisdom and understanding in the church. Because the wisdom we've been learning about here tonight is a prerequisite to be an elder in the local church. If a man doesn't display this kind of godly wisdom as a regular pattern in their life, they are not qualified to become a teacher of God's people in an official capacity. And the whole church has to be on board with this understanding. And I believe that's one of the reasons James shares this teaching about wisdom with the whole church. Because the church needs to know who should occupy the office of elder and who shouldn't. Last question, I'm going to wrap up with this. How can we obtain wisdom? If you've been enjoying what you've been hearing and liking it and amening it, and you're like, I want that. I want that kind of life. How do we do it? Man, the Bible has so much, both Old and New Testament. It talks about wisdom from cover to cover. So, so much that uh, I was almost overwhelmed looking at all these different aspects and ways that you can approach obtaining wisdom. And I, there's not enough time or space to go through all of them. I would, I would uh, encourage you to do a study on your own this week. How to, how to obtain wisdom. Look, and you'll be, you'll be fascinated by how much the Word of God offers us in that, in that vein. But I'm going to give you, I'm going to share one scripture with you that really stood out to me. And this, this one has helped me. If by chance you've ever seen a modicum of wisdom in my life, this is a, this is a key verse from me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. You're not smart enough, strong enough, cunning enough. You don't have what it takes. That's counter to what the wisdom of this world would tell you. <laughs> but I'm telling you this because this is the pathway to receiving wisdom. When I pray to the Lord, like, Lord, I, I want, I'm starting from zero. I'm not bringing anything to the table. I'm a fool. I need you to spell it out so plainly to me. In any situation that I find myself, I need you to tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm a fool. Just tell me what to do. And not just what to do. Tell me how to do it. Show me how to do it. What to do and how to do it constantly. I don't want my ideas. I don't want my past. I don't want my baggage. I don't want me. I don't want any of me brought into the equation. Just you, Jesus. I want to become a fool. I want to stay in that part. I want to lean into I want to embrace my foolishness with a big bear hug and I never want to let it go. Because he says, I oppose the proud, but I give grace to the humble. Those who acknowledge they don't have what it takes, they bring nothing to the table. I'm going to lab, I'm going to give you what you need. But it's not half and half. I'm not contributing part of my wisdom and part of Jesus' wisdom to make some sort of super wisdom. <laughs> like Power Rangers coming together and now we're going to really be wise. Zero from me, all from him. You know when I get in trouble? I pull up some of my... <laughs> ideas into the equation <laughs> my thoughts my feelings my ways let him become a fool so that he can become wise lean into your inability again remember this is counter to what the world tells you the world promises you that you're a special snowflake and you have all the answers <laughs> in your own soul and the bible says you can have all the answers but they're not found in you they're found in him empty yourself be full of him walk in his ways Walk with him and then watch wisdom follow you wherever you go. Let's pray. The more we stay in your word, Lord, and we just we, we, we ruminate, we marinate on it, we just see how, how good you are. 
you want, you want us to experience good things in our life. You designed life to be good. You designed it to be full of abundance and blessing. And you know how blind we are and slow we are and, 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 and not able to learn <laughs> quickly. So you're patient, but you tell us over and over and over again, all through your word, in your church, through your people, by way of your spirit, here is the way, walk in it. Here's what I want you to do, trust me. Here's the path to blessing, follow. Here it is, here it is, here it is. And I just pray, Father, that you'd give us a deposit bigger than we've ever had before, a deposit of faith, that we would take you at your word. We won't doubt your goodness. We won't doubt your plans. We would trust you. We would trust your nature and your character and the words that come out of your mouth as a true lamp unto our feet. Help us to, to bear hug that and to never let it go. But you have to work that in us, Jesus. We can't muster that up. You need to nurture that and produce that in us. So please do it. Because I can speak for my brothers and sisters. I know I can. We want to cultivate peace. We want the kind of life that wisdom would produce. We want it. So please give it to us, Jesus. Please give it to us. And be glorified in that kind of life when we begin to walk in it and live it. So we pray all these things, Lord Jesus, in your amazing name. Amen.